Hey, Dr. Daniel here. And in this video, I want to discuss something that I fully admit I'm not an expert in, uh, and that is math or more specifically statistics. Now, I figure if everyone else is venturing outside their lanes, uh, why can't I? Uh, but that said, while I'm no expert in statistics, I do know enough to understand the difference between relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. Um, and how important that information is in determining the NNT and NNH, the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. Basically, what we're talking about here is how do you interpret the results of a randomized control trial? A very common measure of a treatment is to look at the frequency of a bad outcome of disease in the group being treated compared with those who are not treated, right? That makes sense. You've got two different groups. One group gets the treatment, the other group doesn't. That's your control group. You wanna look at the differences. For instance, supposing that a well-designed randomized control trial in children with a particular disease found that 20% of the control group developed disease, so 20% of people that didn't get treatment developed disease, whereas only 10% of those receiving treatment developed disease, well, there's a number of ways you can interpret that data. 10% uh, is half of 20%. So you could say there's a 50% reduction between the two groups. The difference between 20%, taking again, 20% minus 10% is only 10%, which is obviously a very different number than 50%. Um, both sets of data come from the same data set. Now, why does it matter? Well, would you agree to give this treatment to your child? Uh, again, it depends on how you're presented with the data. When I tell you there's a 50% reduction, you might think like, wow, I've got better odds there. If I tell you there's a 10% difference, not as interesting, but there's other things that we should be thinking about. Personally, without knowing more about the adverse effects of the therapy, um, it's difficult to really say. Now, I'm not so quick to simply let someone do something to my child simply because they said so. Um, certainly, I'm not willing it to, do, to, do, to do it for myself, but again, much less my kids. Now, I want to know if the data is meaningful and worth the risk of intervention. That's a very important thing to think about. Uh, this, of course, has many other variables to consider. What types of population sets did you use? Uh, were these, you know, in a truly randomized study, they're just picking people randomly. Uh, some of the trials, unfortunately, were only done on healthy people. So that obviously is going to be skewed because what are the effects in unhealthy people? Um, so again, what type of population set did you use? How long did you follow the group of people, right, with these interventions? Um, if side effects don't show up for years and you only follow them for a few weeks, that's going to throw off your data. Is there even a risk of disease in the first place? So, you know, of course, this is part of medicalization and disease and fear mongering where we create problems when they don't exist. This is where you really need to consider the risk of treatment versus no treatment. Now, in healthcare, unfortunately, statistics can lead to ill informed decision making. We see statistics all the time. You know, this X treatment results in an 80% reduction of symptoms. Wow, sounds great, but you know, is it meaningful? Now, a classic example is actually Lipitor. Uh, Lipitor, here's an ad, here's one of the original ads of Lipitor. Lipitor is a blockbuster selling drug of all time, one of the best selling drugs aimed at treating high cholesterol, uh, lowering cholesterol. Now, one of the first ads for Lipitor claimed a 36% per reduction in heart attacks. That's pretty good, right? Um, sounds great only this number was the relative risk reduction. Uh, if you look at the absolute risk reduction, which is the risk difference, which happens to be the most useful way to, to, of presenting research results to help your decision-making, 36% actually drops to 1%. Not as sexy, right? So uh, what this means is that out of 100 people who take Lipitor, one person is gonna benefit. This is known as the NNT, the number of uh, needed to treat for a desired outcome. Um, so the number of people needed to treat for one person to benefit from taking Lipitor is 100. Or you could say Lipitor is not effective in 99% of the population. Again, that data is very different from 36% reduction in heart attacks. 
the ideal NNT is going to be one, okay? The ideal NNT is where everyone improves with treatment and no one improves, you know, from the control or lack of treatment. A higher NNT indicates that treatment is less effective. Now, what about the number needed to harm? Well, it turns out that the risk is actually much greater than the reward, especially if we're talking about statins. We all know how nasty statins turned out to be. There's a host of uh, problems that are associated with this. And again, if we don't get all the data, then we can't make good decisions and you start to see fallout. You start to see problems that develop. And unfortunately, there are millions of people that have been damaged because of statin medications. And yet they were thinking that they were doing the right thing by taking it because of the um, you know unhealthy practices that are delivered through some of these uh, data sets. Now, that doesn't mean that no one benefits from a statin. It's just not the best treatment for the majority of the population. And I'd also argue that the same is true for vaccines. Again, it just depends. It's not as easy as saying everybody needs to do it. Now, uh, you know, there's, there is a paper that was published that I wanna share. This is out of Medi uh, Medicina Journal. Uh, the title of the paper, Outcome Reporting Bias in COVID-19 mRNA Vaccine Clinical Trials. This was published February 26th of this year, 2021. And I'm just going to highlight a few notes from uh, this particular paper. I'll include the references if you want to go look this paper up yourself. Uh, basically, this is data that was reported by the manufacturer from Pfizer. Uh, they showed a relative risk reduction of 95%. We've all seen this, right? Pfizer vaccines, mRNA vaccines, 95%. Great, right? Sounds amazing. The absolute risk reduction is only 0.7% not as sexy. And certainly you didn't hear about that. Uh, the Moderna vaccine, uh, the appraisal rates show that a relative risk reduction, 94%, again, super sexy, right? Sounds like a big winner. Only the absolute risk reduction was 1.1%. Now, what would be some reasons why this could be low or why the NNTs are so high? For, for these vaccines, uh, which indicates that they're not as good as, as, as they're, you know, they're, they're made out to be. Well, it could be because the uh, trials were very short. They were only done for a few weeks, which are a problem in itself. These were, these were, they only followed people for a few weeks. Only time will tell what the true, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, adverse reactions are gonna be like, what the two injuries are gonna be like, whether or not it's truly effective. Uh, and I do believe that in some populations they are gonna be more effective because there's people out there that are pretty sick and unhealthy. Um, but again, the data matters, right? And we didn't follow people long enough. Uh, that could be a reason for some of these low risks. Also, the other very real factor of, the fatality rates being so low anyway, which means that, you know, ultimately the risk of getting COVID and dying from it is so low. And this is not to say that all the millions of people that have died, you know, the, uh, of course, nobody that is listening to this, nobody that follows me, nobody that is within the groups of professionals that I work with, that I meet with regularly and discuss these things, none of us want any kind of death or harm to anybody. It's unfortunate for anybody that died, but the reality is, is that most people that have succumbed to this condition have, have done so because of their age, uh, because of their comorbidities. And there, there's a big, you know, there's a lot of risk factors to really look at uh, and to stratify here. There's some additional information that I would share. Um, again, from this paper, there may be much more complexity to the 95% effective uh, announcement than meets the eye, or perhaps not. Only full transparency and rigorous scrutiny of the data will allow for informed decision-making. The data must be made public, and it's certainly not. The FDA's advice for information providers includes provide absolute risks, we're not getting that information, not just relative risks. That's what you're hearing about. Patients are unduly influenced when risk information is presented using a relative risk approach. This can result in suboptimal decisions. Thus, an absolute risk format should be used. Again, this is you know stuff that, that, that you're just not hearing about. Now, just to, again, dive a little bit deeper into understanding relative risk and absolute risk. If we have two different groups, so you have your vaccine group, your experimental group here, you have your placebo group or your control. Uh, the vaccine group, of course, out of 100 people that were given the vaccine, one person ended up developing disease, COVID, um, let's say dying. Well, that's a 1% risk. In, in the vaccine group. Now, if you look at the control group out of 100, let's say two people end up developing COVID and dying. Um, well, that's a 2% risk uh, for, for the control group. Now, 
you could easily say there's a 50% reduction um, between the vaccine and the placebo group because one is half of two, right? 50%. But that's misleading because if you actually look at the number of people that ended up getting sick, two divide and minus the number of people from the experimental group, one, that's a 1% difference. Obviously, you know, if you see a headline 50% reduction, that is much different from a 1%. Uh, difference. So this is really what I'm trying to share with you in terms of uh, trying to help you to understand how some how some of these data points, you know, are misleading if we don't get the full amount of information. Uh, in the discussion, they write, the author write, currently differences between relative effect measures and absolute effect measures uh, in studies are poorly understood by health professionals. What they're saying here is that doctors themselves don't even understand uh, how to interpret the data, much less you know, it's poorly understood by patients, much less people out there, right? So uh, lots of things to think about here. Uh, the conclusions, a critical appraisal of phase three clinical trial data for Pfizer and Moderna shows the absolute risk reduction measures are very much lower than the reported relative risk reduction measures. Yet the manufacturers failed to report absolute risk reduction measures in publicly released documents. Um, basically, Pfizer, Moderna are not going to let this information out now or didn't right now. These, these companies have in, uh, intelligent individuals that work for them. They're, they're not idiots. Um, they know this information. They're just choosing to not share it because, of course, it doesn't sound as good, right, whenever we uh, get all this information. Uh, the U.S. FDA Advisory Committee did not follow FDA-published guidelines for communicating risks and benefits to the public, and the committee failed to report absolute risk reduction measures in authorizing the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for emergency use. Such examples of outcome reporting bias mislead and distort the public's interpretation of COVID mRNA vaccine. I can understand why there's a lot of people out there that are upset if they hear about the negatives associated with vaccination because they went and got a vaccine because they were trying to do the right thing, right? Because health authorities are saying to go do this. And unfortunately, they didn't have all the information presented to them in a way that they could understand that allows them to then make a good decision. Uh, and that's unfortunate. And that's what I'm trying to share this information for. Um, I, it's not about not getting that. I mean, if you want to get vaccinated, it's your body, do it. But if somebody doesn't want to get vaccinated, understand that it's their body and they have every right to not, uh, especially for these reasons, because we're not getting the complete picture. Uh, and that's just not the way that science should work. Uh, another article, Efficacy and Safety Parameters of a Novel COVID-19 Vaccine, published in Frontier Molecular Immunology. This was published March 16th of this year, 2021. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom. I'll include these in, in the references, you know, if you want to look at it, but basically their conclusions. In respect to safety, the frequency of severe adverse reactions, the number needed to harm, which is a thousand, seems to be problematic in a situation of semi-mandatory vaccinating of at least 50% of the population. Now, of course, we're not being forced to do anything, but there's a very strong um, uh, narrative that you should, right? It's the right thing. You do it for other people, but at the same time, at what cost? You know, if there's, I'm, I'm again, if there's somebody out there that's immunocompromised, that has a high risk. Yeah. Okay. If the vaccine is going to help them to reduce that risk. Great. That's great for them. That doesn't mean it's great for everybody. Uh, so we got to be careful with the way that we interpret some of these things. It's also important to, to not to neglect to mention that the increase in harmful effects in the vaccine arm as compared with placebo was twofold, meaning that those people that got the vaccines had much greater adverse effects, harmful effects compared to placebo, compared to people that didn't. Uh, regarding any adverse events and fourfold regarding related adverse events, 21% versus 5%, you're not hearing about that, right? But there's a very real risk of you not needing this vaccine and getting it uh, compared to those people who maybe truly need it. We have decided to present our viewpoint on the recently published data in order to start a well-meaning and inclusive discussion among healthcare workers and health authorities towards more transparency around the important issue of vaccination, as well as to provide a balanced view of the novel COVID-19 vaccine. You know, again, um, all that said, the NNT is pretty high for these vaccines. Remember, the lower the NNT, the better. But why? 
Well, it could be because the risk of death from COVID-19 is actually low already. So there's no difference between the two groups. We also know that the fatality rates are very high for people over the age of 75 and with comorbidities. Um, the other reason could be due to the fact that the clinical trials were only done for a few weeks and with not that many people. Uh, these are inherent problems with the current data sets, no doubt. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get vaccinated. What I'm saying is that you should know all the data and at least question how it's being presented to you before you just jump on board and do something because you were told to do so. The worst thing we can do is outsource our health.